thank you everyone for joining us and welcome to our last speaker event. We have another um, symposium event next week, but our last speaker event in the Mohideen Ibn Arabi Society's uh, series, Al Mizan, Justice and Harmony in the Writings of Ibn Al Arabi and the Akbari Tradition. Uh, today, we are very fortunate to have with us uh, a gentleman and a scholar, uh, a dear friend of mine, Professor Yusuf Kaiswit. Uh, Yusuf Kaiswit uh, is a scholar of Andalusia and uh, North African Sufism. He is the chair of the Islamic Studies at the University of Chicago Divinity School. He received his PhD in Islamic Studies from Yale. He was formerly a humanities research fellow at NYU Abu Dhabi, where he completed his award-winning book, which is really, I uh, highly recommend you check it out, The Mystics of Al-Andalus. He's currently completing an Arabic edition and full English translation of Afif Adin Slimsani's, who is Ibn Arabi's direct disciple, as well as Tunawi's uh, student, Commentary on the Divine Names for the Library of Arabic Literature, NYU Press. And I've seen a little bit advanced copy of it, and it's beautiful. Uh, he's born and raised born in Egypt and raised in Morocco. Yusuf's traveled widely throughout the Islamic world, has studied with Muslim scholars in Morocco, Syria, and Mauritania. Professor Caseworth is one of the rare scholars who has a kind of double training. He was, he gave the, one of the Dars Hassaniya, the Durus Hassaniya, this, it's kind of like the equivalent of the Gifford lectures in the Muslim ones, the royal lectures he gave to the King of Morocco during uh, Ramadan. And as well, he's the chair of Islamic studies at the esteemed University of Chicago. So he's really a kind of joining of the two oceans. We're very fortunate to have him with us today. And he's going to be speaking to us today of upholding the balance to the Msani's commentary on the divine name al muqsid And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kaiswit. Bismillah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ogunayke, for your kind words. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, Hopefully this is one of the last Zoom meetings. Um, so uh, I've, I've worked on uh, Tidim Sali now for several years. He's off, he, he authored uh, several key works, has quite an extraordinary life, trained with some of the great heavyweight champions of, of 13th century Sufism. And he's... Uh, uh, remarkably unknown and understudied and underappreciated, strongly participates in the post avicennan debates on existence, wujud, and uh, has a very strong and independent sense of uh, uh, how things work and uh, the spiritual path and so on. Uh, he, I guess his, his major works, uh, he's mainly a commentator, so he has this commentary on the Book of Standings or the Mawaqif of a Nifari, this early, very uh, mysterious uh, Sufi who has these dialogical writings where he, he converses with God, a uh, very dense uh, text, and Tlimsani has this remarkable commentary on it. He also has a commentary on the Fatiha, which has been edited as well. Uh, the opening chapter of the Quran, and he reached parts of Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter two, and let it go, and then uh, turned to commenting on the divine names, which is the work I've edited and translated. He also is the first commentator on Ibn Arabi's Fusus al-Hikam, Bezels of Wisdom, arguably the first, or I mean, it, it's him, and, and uh, I mean, uh, was it... Uh, uh, anyway, his his commentary it's hard to to date precisely, but it's it's arguably the very first one. Uh, he's also the first commentator on Manaziru Sa'irin of Al Harawi, this very important ethical uh, well a treatise on Sufi ethics, and he has supplementary commentary on the Ta'iya, the poem on on wayfaring of Ibn al Farid. Uh, as well as his own uh, diwan, his own collection of, of uh, poetry. Uh, his life is, is quite remarkable. He moves basically between Cairo, Damascus, and Konya. Uh, that, that, that's sort of the triangle, the basmala of his life, the, those three major cities. 
and and he experiences the full flowering of 13th century Islamic uh, mystical tradition. He was, uh, it's clear that he was the closest friend of Sadruddin al-Qunawi. Al they met actually in their early 20s in the Sa'id al-Su'ada. He's only a few years younger than, than, uh, than Qunawi. So he's his foremost disciple and top pupil um, and closest friend. He meets the eponymous founder of the Shadiliya order. Uh, he marries the daughter of the outspoken Andalusi non dualist mystic Ibn Sabain. Uh, he witnessed the beloved Persian Sufi poet Jalal Dir Rumi at the height of his career in, in, in Konya. His classmates include Saiduddin Farghani, well known for many important works in Arabic and Persian, Fakhruddin Al Iraqi, Mu'ayyuddin Al Jandi. And at the broader level, he's uh, the late Ayyubid, early Mamluk period, when Tlemcani lived, uh, it, it sees the rise of state-sponsored Sufi hospices, Zawiyas and Khanaqas, as well as the institutionalization of Sufi orders from the East, important doctrinal formulations of Sufism in Arabic and Persian. This is the, the age of Fariduddin Attar with his richly symbolic uh, uh, you know, uh, Persian mystical poems. Omar ibn al-Farid, uh, both, both Atar and ibn al-Farid die in the 1230s and Timsani dies in the 1290s, uh, in, in his 80s. So he actually never met these two poets, but is uh, directly engaged with them. And uh, his teacher, Qunawi, wanted to meet ibn al-Farid in Cairo. And he just coincided with ibn al-Farid's last two years of life. And uh, the meeting was, uh, d uh, did not take place. In the sources, he's often referred to by his honorific title, Afif, Al Afif at Tirimsani, meaning the dignified man from Tirimsan, uh, Tirimsan being the northwestern town or city of, uh, in, in contemporary Algeria. And he's, uh, he, he may have been born to an immigrant family in, in Damascus already. It's not clear the extent to which. Uh, he uh, he spent any time in North Africa itself, uh, but it's clear that that when he sought the path, he was already in his late teens and writing some poetry, and he finds himself drawn to the Khanaka of uh, Saeed al So and uh, given the, the so he, if you step back and you look at it from a more from a broader historical perspective. Tirimsani really represents this cosmology, the cosmopolitan nature of Islamic civilization in the seventh century after the Hijra. You have a North African sheikh who's conversant in Persian, studying the writings of Ibn al-Farid in, in Persian at the, at the feet of Qunawi, and quotes some Persian in his text. And the Egypt where he lived for nearly 30 years was the gathering place for Persian, Central Asian, and uh, North African Sufis. Uh, so he's, he's really quite a remarkable figure. And the Sa'idu Su'ada, where he lived, it's really important to also just gain a sense of what this place was like. It, 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 it was a mansion. So this, uh, this is the main Khanaka of Cairo. Uh, if you were dead serious about uh, God, you would have probably ended up at the Sa'idu Su'ada looking for like-minded wayfarers on the path. And this was, uh, so it's a mansion for former Fatimid courtiers converted into a Sufi hospice during the late Ayyubid Sultanate, alongside these law colleges that Ayyub, uh, um, Salahdin Ayyubi, Sal the great Saladin, established in the city. The place still survives, it still stands. It's founded in, in the 1170s, so by the time Tirimsani gets there, it, it had already been functioning for about 40-50 uh, years. And it, the many of the great polemics, uh, the very early polemics between the school of Ibn Arabi on the one hand and the great jurists like uh, Laiz bin Abd Salam and others, they, they're actually taking place between the law colleges, these madrasas in, in, in Cairo, 
and uh, which are presided over by uh, these uh, very prominent legal thinkers. And the, the Hanaka, where Ibn Arabi, Qunawi, Tirimsani, and many other Sufis had stayed. And the Hanaka had uh, the Sheikh of Shuyukh as a position, the Sheikh of Sheikhs. Uh, and and it, it's like the, the diplomatic face of, of official Sufism in this organized Hanaka in, in, the, in the Ayyubid and in, in member period. And then you have the Qadi al Qudat, the judge of, 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 of judges or the chief judge. And so the Hanaka hosts these immigrant Sufis who are displaced on the one hand by the encroaching Mongol threat from the east and then the Christian Reconquista in the west. And you have a salaried sheikh ensuring that the hospice is, is, is run, ensuring that those who live there get a, a little stipend to, to actually meet their very basic needs and ensuring that people attend all of the invocation sessions. So th there was a, a, an attendance sheet for the morning and evening awrad, the, the, the morning and, and evening litanies. And many famous Sufis presided here for long periods of time, over the centuries actually. And it housed thousands of Sufis from around the world. So this is where a lot of the ideas begin to cross pollinate. And it's different from, let's say, Kunawi's outpost out in Kunya, where he's teaching his own close circle of disciples and training them. And Tinimsani spends many years in Konya, 15, about 15 years in Konya, between retreats and study with Sadruddin Qunawi. But but the Sa'idu Su'ada is, is, is a place where it's not meant for just one master. There are multiple uh, groups, multiple teachers. They're teaching hadith, copying manuscripts, having these sort of sama sessions together. So Qunawi is famous. Uh, commentary on Nazmu Ta'iya, the, the poem of Wayfaring, was done en route from Konya to Cairo and also in the Sa'id al Su'ada. And it was attended by dignitaries and uh, townies and official uh, scholars and folks like Tinimsani and others. And the writings, the early commentaries on the Ta'iya, come out of directly as a result of the notes from those classes within that context. So that's very important. I think to, to, to just uh, keep in mind, you have these resident Sufis, the Sufiya Mutajarridun, receiving an allowance. They had a little break time that they, they could go on siyahas, basically, they could wander, go on pilgrimage, uh, go visit the tomb of uh, Ibrahim in Hebron, well, you know, uh, those kinds of things. And Tinim Sani mentions his encounters with all these Sufis in his time in Cairo, as well as in Alexandria and in Konya and Damascus and so on. But, but very often he was residing in uh, the Sa'idu Su'ada Hanukkah. And when later on in his life, he actually starts a family, it seems like he was still living there, uh, which is interesting. Uh, it, it, it wasn't just bachelor, uh, you know, it wasn't only a Sufi bachelor pad. It was also a place where you could have uh, a, a family. Um, and uh, on Fridays, the Sufis would leave the hospice to perform the Friday prayers at the mosque of Al Hakim bi Amrillah. And uh, the, the, the procession from the Sa'idu Su'ada Hanaka to the mosque acquired such fame that uh, people, crowds uh, would gather, these curious admirers would, would come out and uh, they, uh, they would go to what, what was called Duwayrat Sufiya, the little house of the Sufis. All right, so the, the formative period of Tirimsani is in Cairo. He stays there, meets Kunawi early on in his life, then moves to, uh, and Kunawi was, was in his mid-20s, already had all these ijazas from Ibn Arabi. Um, and the, the two of them go to Damascus and they uh, attend the Sama sessions, uh, the, the second reading or of the second redaction of the Futuhat al makiyah of Ibn Arabi. They stayed there for a couple of years. So Tlemcani really just met Ibn Arabi for, uh, I mean, he sat in his classes for two years and he's on the, uh, he's on the attendance sheet that was taken by Qunawi himself. And these uh, early Akbarians were, were keen to write down, 
you know the names of, of the attendees and, and and who did what uh, probably from the uh, you know in a sense uh, imitating or 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 uh, uh, it's, it's, it's copying the habits of the of, of the hadith scholars then he moves to 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 Konya for some 15 years that's where he has uh, he, he's known to take to do to have done 40 40 day retreats around the, the the mountains of Anatolia the number is not to be taken literally as one of his colleagues reminds us in 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 this archive that I found it's it's it means that he was doing a lot of retreats a lot of the time uh, over the span of uh, 15 years and then he moves back to Cairo after Konya there was some instability at the time with the Mongol invasion so on and Konawi himself has to pick up and go back to Cairo. So he sort of circumambulates that uh, the, the, the triangle that I described, uh, ends up in Cairo for a second time. That's where he meets Ibn Sabayin and writes his, he begins putting pen to paper in his mid forties, something like that. And then finally lands this remarkable position in Damascus, uh, moves there with his family and Konawi moves back to, to Konya where he trains, you might say, the second wave of uh, later students of, of Sadruddin al-Qunawi, but the two stay in touch. They may not have never met again physically, but we do have correspondences where, where Qunawi writes to Tirimsani and tells him about his uh, disc the disclosures he experienced on his pilgrimage, which is interesting because that's what the disciple does when, when they're communicating with their sheikh. So when you're sharing your spiritual experiences, and drawing lessons from them too, uh, it, there is a certain camaraderie there that's that's uh, um, that's evident, and uh, uh, not that they're on par, but 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 the, but they're but, but that they're very close. And he refers to him very scarcely in his in his own writings. Tim Sani doesn't very often quote anyone. He, he, he'll he'll mention people just as an illustration of some point he's making or a station that he's trying to describe. So the. The key, right? What, what you find now is, therefore, it's an eloquent, clear thinking, philosophically trained uh, poet with, with the depth of a realized Sufi saint, uh, the confidence of one as well, and the, the originality of, of someone who's, who's uh, traversed the path. And the core difference, I would say, between commentaries on the divine names written by proponents of the Akbari tradition. Uh, on the one hand, let's say, like Tim Sani, and Sufi Asharite commentators like Kushairi or Ghazali on the other, is that Tim Sani takes to heart the proclamation that only God is real, and that the realm of other than God is unreal. If you press him, he'll say it's ma'adum, it, it doesn't exist, uh, or it exists in a relative sense. This realm that we're in, the, 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 the realm of Masih Allah or in the heart of the knower of God, it does not exist. But in the heart of the, of, of, of the one who's oblivious to God, it does exist. Now, the, the, the Asharite, let's say, the, the other stream, let's say, of, of, of uh, commentaries on the divine names, they're not guided by this foundational tenet. You'll have Ghazali making these non-dualist proclamations in his writings too, but an author like him tends to wear multiple hats. Um, and is some you could say less consistent, uh, more prone to uh, as um, uh, allegorical interpretation when things don't really uh, sit well with his theology and so on. So what you have is a, a very consistent uh, thinker and 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 and, and Sufi with uh, who 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 bases his his entire approach, you might say, on the what he calls the root names an understanding of the dynamic between the name Allah on the one hand and the name Ar-Rahman on the other. So the, the, the plurality of names comes about by virtue of God's actions. These acts, af'al, like the creator, the bestower, have properties. Those properties come about by virtue of the disclosures of, of names, which issue from the qualities of the essence and the, the names root back or they, they go back to Allah and Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman gives and bestows and it's the name of mercy and existentiation, motion 
uh, imminence and so on. And Allah is the name of transcendence and grandeur and uh, inaccessibility and so on. And so what you have then is these two root names uh, combining together or, or interacting and giving rise to the branch names. So the Asma'ul Usul give rise to the Asma'ul Furu'a, the, the, the branch names. And uh, it's basically a commentary on call upon Allah or Rahman, whichever you comment upon, call upon, uh, to God belong the most beautiful names. You, you have in his work a systematized understanding of what Qunawi was talking about, of, of, of Qunawi's teachings, and uh, who himself is, of course, an, uh, already a very systemized thinker. And you have uh, the writings of Ibn Arabi present at almost every page. The one of the key highlights, I guess, I would say, uh, just to introduce the name Al Muqsit or the Equitable, is that the names in Tirimsani are both hierarchical and co equal. From what I've said, it's clear that there is a hierarchy within the names. You have the root names, Allah and Ar Rahman, and you have a cluster of names that fall under. Uh, Ar Rahman on the one hand and Allah on the other. So the Creator would obviously fall under the name the All Merciful, Ar Rahman, because it's a name of giving. Whereas uh, Al, uh, Al Qabid, the Constrictor, would fall under the name Allah uh, because it's it's it, it denotes uh, transcendence and uh, dissimilarity and so on. At the same time, even though there's this hierarchy and division, he insists that there uh, that the names are interpenetrated. In other words, every name is found within every name and that they're co-equal. It just depends on the perspective from which you, you're beholding a particular name. So when you say hierarchy of the names, you mean that some names are closer to the divine essence than others. The root names, Allah and Ar-Rahman, are superior to the other names in this respect. Then the branch names are subordinate and encompassed by them. However, at the same time, the names are interpenetrated. So you can behold anything in creation, any trace, any athar of the created realm, and you can find within it every name. And he actually, he has a whole section of his commentary on the Fatiha where he, he, he locates the name Al-Hadi, the guide, within every name. And you can find, so if you you know, observe anything. Uh, one day I was, uh, you know, you, you're taking a walk and you're, you're, you look at a flower, you, you, you can reflect on how uh, it, it reflects uh, the traces of every single name. You just have to know the names well enough to understand the ways in which it reflects it. Chicago is freezing in the winter, so you would say, how could the name al Basit, the expander, uh, display its traces in a Chicago blizzard. Well, actually, that's the beginning of life. And the spring, from a certain perspective, is the end of life. So the spring is Al-Qabid, the withholder, uh, the contract constrictor, and winter is the expander, is the beginning. Or you can flip it around and say, no, it's, 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 it's the other way around. So the names are co-equal, they're, they're, they're co-hierarchical. None of my students who live in Chicago are particularly fond of that example, by the way. They're they, they insist that it's, it's all qab, it's all constriction in, in, in Chicago winter. Okay, so the whole perspective is, uh, the whole tradition from which he, he operates is perspectival. It's i'tibari. It's, it's a question of what perspective you're, you're analyzing the effect of the properties of a name. One thing that's also unique in the commentary, very briefly, and, uh, but it's very interesting, is he has this apothecary. Of the, of, of the divine names. That each name, when invoked, is a, brings about certain effects in the soul, in the human soul. And that to guide disciples along the path, the sheikh needs to be aware of the properties of each name and has to medicate each disciple according to where he or she is at their own sort of stage or level of development. So for instance, if it's time for someone to withdraw from the world, from workaday life and enter into the Hanukkah, 
uh, and the sheikh wants to uh, bring them into that state of, of temporary uh, tajreed, the sheikh would uh, um, prescribe the name al-wakil, uh, which means the trustee, uh, without actually um, telling them that he's going to command the disciple to enter into tajreed, to enter into withdrawal from the world at the Zawiyah. And so the disciple begins to um, uh, invoke the name Al-Wakil until disclosures of that name appear are directly witnessed by the disciple. And uh, a sense of trust in God and not the secondary causes is developed. And then the disciple can easily integrate himself or herself into the Zawiyah. The Asharite disciples should not invoke al mutaali or something like that, the names of, of excessive transcendence. They actually need names of imminence. And so he's very specific at each name, what name is good for what. Certain names give a weak opening. Certain names give a strong opening. Certain names are, are good for recovering from the shock of a disclosure. Certain names are good for recovering, for uh, 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 gathering intimacy in the heart and so on. Okay, so this is the name al muqsit He's going to talk about how the name the equitable is uh, how he enters into how God loves those who have equilibrium and those who don't, but from different presences. So that's where he's going. And then he, he, he goes later on into how the name the equitable sort of oversees the equilibrium that's uh, pervasive throughout existence that gives rise to, to, to existent things. And he insists that the uh, even things that lack equilibrium are actually effects of the name, the equitable, because in their disequilibrium, they are demonstrate that they're perfectly in equilibrium in their very disequilibrium, that kind of thing. So he first cites, uh, as, uh, as per his custom, uh, where the name appears in the Quran. Uh, that's basically the verse where it's not really the, the, the divine name, al does is not mentioned in the Quran in, in, in this sense. But God loves the equitable. It's a name that's ascribed to the servant, but also to the Lord. And Shahid Allah, uh, right? God proclaims that, he's, uh, that there's no God but He, and uh, He upholds equitability. Not all authors agree that it's a divine name. There's no hard consensus on the definitive list of divine names. The lists typically go beyond 99. So Ibn Barajan is, is one of them. And this is just a, a reference. In his day, Ghazali and Ibn Barajan were the major commentaries. He just makes that a point. Not that he's really reading the commentary. He just he wants the reader to know the status of that name in relation to the other commentaries. Qist means equitability or balance. And God says God loves the equitable. Inna Allah yuhibbu al That is the upholders of balance. And they gain this love. They gain God's love by realizing their relationship to the name the equitable. So God's love for the equitable is gained by the servants realization of their relationship to that name. For God loves none other than his own quality. This for me is an interesting point because if you look up love in Ghazari and others, they're very careful not to become anthropopathic about it, just to ascribe imperfect psychological human emotions to God. And they say, well, he loves, but not in that sense and so on. And so that tension is sort of released when you just go non-dualist. And you say, well, God loves none other than his own quality. And so there isn't this anthropopathic implication. And he, so he says, this love is an aspect of God's love for himself. And its reality flows through all the levels of existence, none of which love anything but themselves. This too is one of the meanings of God's upholding the balance. Ogunaike, any thoughts you wanted to share? Or so far so clear? Uh, for me, so far so clear. I mean, this thing of uh, God's loves himself. I mean, you see this again and again in other Sufi commentaries. Everything that God loves, it says that God loves in the Quran. It's usually people. He loves the muhsineen. He loves the, it's, it's usually this form. He loves the people who do this form for kind of 
they, they perform certain qualities and attributes that are attributed to God. And so God loves his own reflection. That's um, right. Mm. So you know, God's looking into the mirror of nothingness, sees his own reflection there in uh, creation, which is only relatively real. And he loves his own reflection yeah. in, in, in there. But then the interesting part here is that all of the existence also only love, love nothing but themselves. Mm. Right. And then this is Ibn Chidik has that article on uh, divine love in which he, Ibn Arabi kind of ties this up in knots as well. He says, oh, you only really love yourself. You don't actually love God. Mm. And he also says, love always only attaches itself to nothingness. Um, Whereas if you open and, Ghazali, he would speak of this in terms of the will to bless the servant. Exactly. exactly. It's a very different uh, metaphysical uh, assumption and therefore a different understanding of what, of what uh, love is. So the, the love of the existence is at the same time nothing but God's love for himself through these things, as yeah. well as the existence own love for themselves. So the yeah. love, my, my love. Through the name, the equitable. With, through the name, the equitable. Well, that's, uh, that's a manifestation. That's, that's what's equitable about it. It's balanced. Mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it's uh it's 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 equal god god's love can only attach itself to something worthy of his love the only thing worthy of god's love is god um, and it's 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 fair so my love for chocolate for my kids for anything is really only god's love for himself through me that's and right. my love for these things is also my just my love for myself in a particular form and all so of then you become a locus of mm -hmm. god's self love yeah. like a yeah, Mahat. exactly, exactly. Yeah. Let's go to the next paragraph where he talks about uh, there he, uh, the, the preparedness of the servant is what determines their experience, basically, of whatever name discloses itself to them and their relationship to that name. So having spoken of God's love for himself and uh, for the, those who have equilibrium, the qasit, the, the muqsitun, he also brings in this word qasitun, which is the opposite, the doers of iniquity, or the deviants, al-ja'irun. And they are, kanu li hataba. They are the kindling of the fire. And deviants, jawr, is to stray from the middle of the road. The middle of the road is balance in reality. And the deviants are the kindling of the fire precisely because preparedness, their preparedness brings about devi deviance, which is a type of disequilibrium. All right. So all things lack equilibrium, all things that lack equilibrium must be cleared of their dross. And this is the word sabk in Arabic, very key term, in order to be restored into a state of equilibrium, which is balance. The imbalanced existence are loved by the real as well. From the presence of his name, the gathering, and jami'ah, and from the presence of his name, the encompassing. So what, uh, from what presence, Ogunayke, are the, uh, the doers of iniquity not loved by God? I mean, from one point, because all of the names are in all the other ones, there's no, they're loved from all presences, because in a jami, al jami has all of them. Mm -hmm. But if you want to get specific, I mean, I think, I think that's the real answer. But if, if we want to get specific and look at them in their exclusive uh, exclusive terms, you could say, okay, there's a share of Rahim that they're not getting. There's a share of Wadud or Latif that they're not getting. Because, you know, clearing out the, you don't gently clear off dross. That's a, yeah. that's a, that's, that's a tough, that's a tough thing. Or any, any name of specification that's not generalized, uh, you could say. But I think the real answer is because particularly a name, the names like al Wasil, the encompassing al jami or the gathering, by the definition, they include, uh, first of all, all the, all the names include all the names, but if these names in particular include everything yeah. by their very definition. So they're not really excluded from any presence at the deepest level, mm. at, the, at the kind of more uh, specific when considering things separately, separately, then you could say, yeah, there are these particular names of specified mercy, uh, Does God love the deviants from the presence of his name, the equitable? Yes, absolutely. Because the, the, this love, I, I would say so, because it's bringing them back into equilibrium, just as what uh, goes on above is, is coming through equitability. That's also what's going on here. Very nice. Okay. Well, I think uh, uh, Tilim Sani is uh, 
we'll, we'll go about expressing a very similar concept just a few lines below. So let's let's keep going. But so far, so clear, right? The, and what I mean here, you have this uh, preparedness as a, I think a really key term. So preparedness to bring about deviance, which is a type of disequilibrium. So disequilibrium is is equated with a type of preparedness within the soul for deviance. It's a sti'dad for that zone. All right. Now he says, um, so the imbalanced existence are loved by the real from the presence of his name, the gathering, and from the presence of his name, the encompassing. This is because his encompassment necessitates that all movements of existence move toward him. Therefore, imbalanced existence also turn their attention to him by their very imbalance, for imbalances in relation to him are balanced. This is because his existence is not compatible with anything, whereas all things are incompatible with another thing insofar as they are distinct from each other. So this is a key sentence here. I think this is because his existence is not incompatible with anything. From the, He's speaking from the name, the gathering, right? So the, that which brings together all things. And then he, he quotes this verse, nothing within me is compatible with anything else, and nothing within you is incompatible with anything else. Okay, now, so we went from God's specific love for the equitable, for the, those with equilibrium, to his universal love from the presence of these universal names, like the gathering, for all existence. And now he's going to move to sort of untangle this, this, uh, this concept of his, his universal love. It is through this reality, like let's say the reality of the name, the the al the, the gathering, that the doers of iniquity who are imbalanced deviants, al jairun al munharifun, burn. So the 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 eschatological torment is identified with this preparedness for disequilibrium. Correct. For when, oh, sorry. For when the disclosure of oneness encounters those who deviate from oneness, it coerces them by returning them back to itself. This is what you're talking about. There's no uh, gentle way of scrubbing off dross or something, right? That returning through coercion, الرَّدُّ بِالْقَهْرِ is the chastisement itself. It is the clearing of their dross, a sabk, in order to restore them coercively back to equilibrium because God loves them though not from the direction of the name, the equitable. Don't worry, Ogunayke, 42.4, you're gonna get back to your point. But in, right here, from this, from a certain i'tibar, of course, from, from the perspective of God's clearing the dross or, or coercively bringing back the, uh, those who lack equilibrium to a state of equilibrium, it's not love, it's qahr, it's sabk, it's uh, majesty, it's uh, rigor, punishment, chastisement, and so on. For his love, for so the clearing of the dross in order to restore them coercively back to this equi to equilibrium because God loves them, though not from the direction of the name the equitable. For his love for existence from the direction of his name the equitable is a love for those who have equilibrium, i.e., the equitable. Okay, so this is now like a you could say, a, a, from one atibar, from one perspective, he's affirming the exclusive love that God has for those with equilibrium that excludes those who don't. Now he's going to turn to his love for the deviants, as for his love for the deviants, or the doers of iniquity, jairun. It is a love from the direction of his name, the encompassing. For his encompassment is not like the encompassment of one thing by another in a manner of containment, but like larfiya, not like something containing something literally, rather it's a supersensory, Love stemming from the fact that the entity that Al Ain is one. So I, I read this as it's a bit ambiguous, but Al Ain is one, just that there's only God, there's only one thing, and, and, and that's it. And since the movements of the balanced and imbalanced alike only occur with his assistance, and since he is the ultimate end of every mover, whether that movement is balanced or imbalanced, to him returns the entire affair. So so any, any any thoughts here about the contrast between his exclusive love 
for the equitable and his ex inclusive love for uh, for the iniquities. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think what he's doing is kind of there are different levels of equity here. There's a kind of basic level of equity, and then there's an equity which is the balance of equity and inequity. Yeah. Uh, so there's and and so that's a higher level of equity which is more encompassing. And the mm -hmm. ayn being one, it's not there aren't two things. You don't put one thing inside another jar. It's yeah. a single entity that you can conceptually look at from different angles, but there's no real division is possible. Mm -hmm. And because of that, no real, no real division being possible. In the end, we'll end up seeing equity and inequity resolve into a larger unity because everything has to resolve into a larger unity. So I think that's where it's going. Yeah. So the love that God has for the iniquitous or the deviants is higher than his love for the equitable in the sense that the names if you assert hierarchy mm -hmm. and you say al is, is is a very specific name of, of balance then it's a more specific sort of lower in the sense he's he's almost inverting what one might assume god's love to, to for the uh, equitable to entail okay so this is where it all sort of I think becomes very clear. God effects a correspondence between his presence and the directions to which his existence turn. This he does by virtue of the scope of his oneness, which is drawn by the secret of his unity, which in turn remains fixed through the fixity of his essence. As such, his love for imbalanced things is from a higher presence than his love for balanced things, which includes the equitable. His love for the equitable, for its part, is from a lower presence, even though the equitable have a higher status in eminence. Yet, from a different perspective, neither of the presences is more eminent or higher than the other. As we said, that is the presence of the name, the encompassing. God is behind them, encompassing. Uh, I think that, uh, as far as time goes, this is a, a good place to, to stop and open the floor for uh, discussions and so on. But. Yeah, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation, not just, and the beautifully translated text. I mean, I've read some of them, it's not easy to translate in a way that's as clear and cogent as this really beautiful translation. And thank you also so much for the very detailed uh, social and historical background that really helps us kind of contextualize this as well.